Okay, so there's a rifle over there. Let's go ahead and pick up that rifle. In my last Godot video, I explored how to create a basic client and server network setup where we built a dedicated Linux build and deployed it to an EC2 server. And then we just sent a simple RPC message, string message back and forth between the client and server just to show how that communication would work. But I was curious if there were other data types that we can send or other data formats and what that would look like. And also, can we talk to outside resources? Can we make HTTP calls to get or save data from some other service or resource outside of our Godot ecosystem. So let's have a look at how to do that today. For this example project, I put together this little example town to hopefully demonstrate some use cases where you may want to actually call RPCs to send data back to the server. And we'll touch on those more in a minute. But first, let's just kick off the game. All right, so we're inside this building. Let's just go ahead and run out. And forgive me, there are some bugs. I didn't really spend a whole lot of time putting the demo together. I just wanted to have something for illustrative purposes. So if we head on over to the server, we're already SSH'd in, so I'm gonna go ahead and run it. So that is our Godot server running on an EC2 instance there. So if we come back into the client, let's go ahead and connect. And you can see there, our client has connected to the server, great. And the first button we see underneath the connect is this text message button. And if we hit that, we just send a basic string back to the server. This is a simple RPC call that we also went over in the last video. So let's just have a quick refresh on what that looks like. So here's our UI button signal that we hit where it, we call the send message to server RPC. And let's go take a look at that. And it's very basic. It accepts a string parameter and we just send a message right back to the client. Nothing too fancy. So let's take a look at the next button. We have send dictionary to server. So before we get started, let's go look at that UI signal. So when you click that button, it hits this function and we build this coin item with some custom field values. Then we convert it to a dictionary object. We use the built-in JSON library to stringify it. And then we send that string to the server through this RPC. So let's just see what that looks like in practice. Okay, I'm gonna hit send dictionary to server. And if we look at the server panel, you can see that it printed out what looks to be a JSON object, and then it prints out a generic debug statement with each of the individual items printed out just to demonstrate that we have the correct object. So let's go have a look at how that works. So when the RPC receives that string message, we use the same JSON library to parse it. We get the data out of it here in this line, convert it back to a dictionary, and then we rebuild the coin item based on those parameters that we set through the RPC call. And then we use the inverse string to variant call to translate that string back into an integer. And now that we have that coin object, I just wanted to demonstrate that we do have a complete object with those values set in this line here. And then of course, we just send a message right back to the client. Let's take a look at the next button, send object to server. So if we hit that, you can see a message object was received on the server and we print out a debug statement with the individual fields that were set in that object. So let's take a look at how that's done. If we go back up to the UI section, this is the send object to server function that was just hit. We build another custom object, but instead of converting it to a dictionary, we use this variant to string that converts the whole object into a string. And then we send that whole object to the server via this RPC call. And you can see here, we use the string to variant call to convert that passed in coin object back into the coin item that we sent to the RPC. And we know it worked because in this debug statement, we actually print out the individual fields to verify that it worked. And let's take a look at the console to see what that looks like. And you can see here, we do have the individual parameters that were set on the client printed out correctly on the server. So there's three basic ways that we can send data between a client and server. The first way was sending a basic string primitive. And the second way was still using a string. However, this time it was a JSON object and we were able to convert it back to a dictionary and set those values as needed. And the third way was still a string, but we were actually able to convert it back to the original item using the string to variant call. And the demonstration of these different RPC calls sending strings back and forth between the client and server seems to be in line with what's in the documentation. You can see here that RPCs will not serialize objects or callables. So it is up to you to send the data in a more RPC friendly string format. And you may be wondering, why would I ever use this dictionary method when it seems so verbose. I can just call this string to variant in one line here and get exactly what I need. Well, first let's just take a look down here at the log. I actually printed out all the objects before I sent them. So here's the dictionary version. Very short and concise, and that's great. It's exactly what we need in this use case. 
but look at the string to variant printout here. It's the whole entire underlying object with all of its parent fields because it's actually an area 3D. So not only are you getting the immediate data that you wanted for that coin, you're also getting the whole underlying object as well. And you're sending that over the network. And I'm always gonna recommend to send the least amount of data possible to achieve whatever functionality you want. Because if you don't, that's some serious technical debt and your transmission charges for whatever server you're using could add up over time, especially if your game grows. So in this case, unless you absolutely need to send all this data of the underlying object, or maybe you have a custom object and you can kind of trim out the fat with what you, what you don't need here. And I didn't have to send the whole entire coin item. The coin item is a area 3D, but it doesn't have to be. So in that case, the, the object would actually be much lighter weight. So just keep that in mind when you're sending different types of objects, you're always kind of stay on the leaner side of how much data you want to send between client and server. So I also want to show you some use cases where sending messages via RPC will come in handy. So let's go back up to the top here and let's have a look back at the game. Of course, I'm upside down because my mouse controls are very primitive. So let's pull up the server really quick. And so let's just say you have this game where you're collecting coins. So you may want to save the point value for each coin to the server and you can send that via RPC. So if I run into this, you can see that the server actually received a message. So received a message of 34. Now you could expand this to be something more meaningful inside some other object. But for this demo, I'm sending that that coin was worth 34 points. So let's take a look at the logs to see what happened. So we are sending an item points to the server of 34 points. So you could also send along the actual player ID with this 34 points and very easily update the server like, hey, player three added 34 points to their total. So that's one good use case. Let's collect another coin, but let's see how we did that. So if we look at this coin object, I have this on coin body enter callback that gets triggered when you collide with other objects. And then we use this points collected signal to admit that that player had collected 34 points. And that gets emitted back to the network here under points collected. And then we can send an RPC message with those points to the server. And again, like I said, you can build out a small little dictionary that has the player ID and the points collected, and you can save that to your database or however you're tracking this information. And let's just take a look back at that coin class really quick. You also notice that I have this body.pickup item. So what's really nice about this on collision is that it also gives you what the coin collided with. In this case, it was the player object. And we do have a callback called pickup item. So if you needed to perform some animation or some other action on the player when he collided with a coin or any object, you could do that right here with this callback. And you can see here, this is where it was called. So let's take a look at another example. All right, let's clear out the server. Okay, so there's a rifle over there. Let's go ahead and pick up that rifle. Okay, so I collected the rifle and you can see on the server side, we printed out an ID of one, two, three, four. So what did that do? If we look at the rifle script, I have the same kind of callback when something collides with the rifle. And in this case, we call item picked up and we emit the item ID. So where does that signal get called to? Let's take a look back at the network. We have this item collected function here. Now, if you notice, we're doing two things here. The first one, we send an RPC call back to our server with the item that he just picked up. You can see that printed back on the server. And again, you could also attach the player ID if you wanted to. But what is the second thing here? So the saved item to inventory actually emits the item ID to some other signal. So let's go have a look at what that's doing. So up at this backend class, we have the save item to inventory function. And what that's gonna do is make a web request to some outside server. This is not the Godot server. This is some other backend resource. And in this example, I'm using AWS Lambda to handle this request. And you can see up here, here's the backend URL given by API Gateway. And down here, we take that item that was passed in through the signal and we make a little dictionary. We convert it to JSON. We set the header to application JSON, and then we make that request, that post request to the back end with that data. And again, you could also add the player ID on here to make it more of a complete example. So let's take a quick look at what that looks like on the back end. So on the back end, I just have this really simple Node.js Lambda function. All it does is it checks for an event body, which in this case would be our JSON object. And if it exists, we print out the item ID. For your game, you can add some code in here to actually save to a database or make some other service call or whatever you want to do for your game. And if we take a look at the logs, 
you can see down here on this line that we printed out saving item to inventory 1234. And if we look at the expanded version of that request, it was sent over in the body in this string JSON format. So we know our item was correctly received from the client on this backend Lambda function outside of the whole Godot environment. So that's really cool. You can do a lot of stuff with that. What this last example really highlights is there's a lot of functionality that your game may need that's not directly tied to the gameplay itself. What if you want to build a more robust chat system or you're sending analytics or metrics somewhere? Maybe you're building a matchmaker or lobby system or maybe there's in-app purchases or some other data that needs to be saved somewhere else. You can use this HTTP library that's built into Godot to make those requests from your client or server to save off that data because you don't really want to slow down your server with that non-critical, you know, extraneous functionality that your game may need but doesn't necessarily need to run on the server itself. So keep that in mind when you're developing or planning your game that there are other cheap services that will only charge you for when you're actually using the service and it's not gonna sit there and just accumulate costs. Like AWS Lambda is a great, I use this all the time, it's a great solution, it's a great option. It's, it's very easy to spin up prototypes for whatever functionality you're trying to make and it's it's going to be very uh, cost effective as well. Regardless of the feature that you're trying to develop, uh, just remember that you can use Lambda or some other server, serverless technology to accomplish that for you. And also I would consider using a Lambda function for more slower paced games. Like I did a bunch of examples with Unity, with WebSockets, or maybe you just have a card game and you're not really needing that WebSocket back and forth connection and you can just get away with, you know, HTTP posts or something like that. That's a really good alternative to running a full-blown Godot server build on some server in the cloud because that's going to charge you for every minute that's running. So keep in mind, Lambda is a good alternative. You can use it as a back-end server for your game if you want, if you don't need that physics simulation though to check those like interactions and simulate what's happening on the client to make sure that everything happened as it was supposed to happen. Like if you have a simple card game or maybe a, a, a game that the movement is really slow and it's more of an exploratory type game where you don't need to be checking a thousand times a frame to make sure everything is where it needs to be. Lambda is a good alternative option for that. And speaking of that, I do have some more videos in the works that will highlight some of these more complex scenarios and provide a walkthrough of the functionalities that most of us will need when building out our game. So you don't wanna miss it. Make sure you're subscribed. And as always, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.